Welcome to worship on this Easter Sunday. I am Scott Cox, Senior Minister at Speedway Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Here in a moment, we will be joined by four other people. Katie Griffin, our Associate Minister. Evan Cogswell, our organist. Alice McCoggan, one of our elders. And Ray Tice, another one of our elders. All of us will be helping to lead us in worship on this day. I think of the words of our United Church of Christ sisters and brothers. They often begin their worship services with these words. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I borrow those words and say that to you on this day. You are welcome, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You will also have the opportunity to join in communion here in a few moments, so you may want to pause this video. You may want to get uh, bread and juice or cracker and water or whatever elements you want to use as part of communion. We'll be sharing in that here in a few moments. Once again, welcome. I hope you're touched by the presence of God on this Easter Sunday, the God who gives us hope and joy. God bless you.
how joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love because Christ is risen. We are called to be Easter people because Christ is risen. Darkness cannot claim us because Christ is risen. Fear cannot bind us because Christ is risen. Friends, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. days. We worship with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to Jesus's resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love for all people everywhere. Amen. I have two scriptures I would like to share with you this morning. The first is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Let us hear this word for us, the people of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. 
The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They, did, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to the where they were staying. Now Jesus stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is, who is it that you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where, have you, where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Arabic, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. Hi, friends. This is a moment for our, all of our children and all of those who are young at heart. I would like to share a book with you this morning. It is called The Mystery of Easter. So you see right there on the front, that's Jesus. So it's called The Mystery of Easter. And it says, There once was a man who loved big enough to change the whole world. People knew he was in God and God was in him. Everywhere he went, people would ask him, what's the best way to live? This man, whose name was Jesus, would answer. See, there's another picture of him right there. And if you can see it, there's a heart right above him with people in it to show, I think, that that's all the people that Jesus loves and how he wants us to love. So this man named Jesus would answer about the best way to live. He would answer love. Love God, love yourself, love everyone else. See, there's that heart that's bigger now. I wonder who all those people are inside of it. Now here's some more people. and They don't look very happy, do they? I wonder why. Now there were some people who didn't like what Jesus was teaching. He did not, they did not want to be told to love God, to love themselves, and to love everyone else. It's a very hard thing to love that big. Instead of learning this hard thing, they decided to have Jesus killed. And this is the hard part of the story. Tell this part of the story. When we tell this part of the story, we always say, this is not the end of the story. The hard part of the story is that Jesus' enemies did not want to learn to love, and so they had Jesus killed on a cross. The cross reminds us of a very sad thing. Jesus' friends the ones who knew he was in God and that God was in him were very sad. They remembered how they felt when Jesus was around. 
like God was in them too, and their hearts were broken. See, there's a picture of their broken hearts. Jesus' friends put him in a tomb, which is like a cave, and they used a big stone for the door. Then they took some time to cry and hug and try to fix their broken hearts. I think those might be Jesus' friends. What do you think? Later, several of Jesus' friends went to the tomb where he was buried. Sometimes, when you're very sad because someone has died, it helps to visit, to visit their grave. The tomb was like a grave, and Jesus' friends were very sad. When they got there, they discovered that the huge, huge stone that had been blocking the entrance was out of the way. See, there's a picture. Inside, they saw a man dressed in a white robe who said to them, do not be afraid. You're sad, but here is good news. Jesus is alive again. This is a mysterious story. This is the story that changes the cross. It still reminds us of a sad thing, but now it also reminds us of a good, important thing. Now it reminds us that no matter what happens, no matter how hard things are, that we are with God and that God is with us. See, there's a picture of the cross. This is the secret to loving God, loving yourself, and loving everyone else. Because God is always with you. Thank you for letting me share that story with you. I really like the way that it tells the story of Jesus and the resurrection. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all of our stories. We thank you for Jesus and the ways that he helped us to love. Amen. Thanks, friends. Have a good week.
Let us pray. Gracious God, speak a fresh word of resurrection to our lives, that you might burst us forth from the graves of our own doing and the world's doing. Bring renewal to us that we might join our voices with the news of this day. Christ is risen. Amen. When Mario Cuomo was governor of New York, he accepted an invitation to speak to the New York City Press Club. When he was leaving the governor's mansion in Albany, his wife reportedly said to him, Mario, this is going to be a tough crowd, but don't try to be witty, charming, or intellectual. Just be yourself. Today, Maybe the best thing I can do is just be myself because the news and wake of this day carry themselves. Christ is risen. It seems that I should stop the sermon now because there's not much to add. Besides, this will keep you from fast forwarding through this recorded sermon. But I get paid to preach a little longer than a minute, so I will add some to it. Actually, there really is a lot to add. The various accounts of the Easter story found in Matthew, Luke, and John are rich in their details. You may want to read them when you have a chance. Interestingly, Mark has no resurrection story. But notice the conclusion that Mary Magdalene came to in our reading today. In verse 2, Mary Magdalene says to Simon Peter and an unnamed disciple, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. In verse 13, Mary Magdalene said to two angels, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And then in verse 15, Mary Magdalene mistook the risen Jesus for being a gardener. And she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Do you notice what happened four times in these three verses? Mary Magdalene made the wrong conclusion. She told the two disciples that someone had stolen Jesus' body. Then she thought that the two angels may have removed Jesus' body. Then she mistook the risen Jesus for a gardener, and she thought maybe he had removed Jesus' body. These were logical conclusions. It's not every day that someone rises from the dead, and it's not every day that anyone sees the risen Jesus. But God can't be confined to our logical, scientifically shaped minds. God sometimes defies logic. Now, utilizing logic is one of our hallmarks in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We believe that one of the ways that God speaks to us is through our minds. God has given us brains, and we ought to use them. After all, Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. So we shouldn't leave our brains at the door when we enter the sanctuary. But God is more than what can be confined between our ears. It can't be proven scientifically or rationally that Jesus rose from the dead. If there had been a video camera there the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the camera could not have captured what happened. The resurrection is a truth beyond what can be seen and greater than what any of our five senses can capture. The resurrection can only be experienced with the sixth sense, which is faith. I've heard it said that if God does something, then there has to be the possibility to doubt it. Why? Because if we can't doubt it, then there is no room for faith. It can't be proven that God created the universe and all that is in it. It can't even be proven that there is a God. But by faith, we can say that there is. The resurrection of Jesus defies logic. People simply don't rise from the dead. But what if it is true that Jesus did? Wouldn't it change everything? Wouldn't it change us? In the sixth chapter of the book of Romans in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that because Jesus rose from the dead, we are to walk in newness of life. 
If Jesus rose from the dead, then resurrection can happen within us. If Jesus rose from the dead, we can have a new beginning. Jesus' disciples experienced this newness. They had forsaken Jesus when he was seized by the authorities out of fear that they would be seized since they had been seen with him. So they went into hiding. To state it mildly, they became downhearted when Jesus was murdered. Then the risen Jesus appeared to them and those once timid, fear-filled disciples began boldly to proclaim that Jesus had been brought to new life by the power of God. Simon Peter is one example of this. He became a walking, talking demonstration of how experiencing resurrection causes a person to walk in newness of life and how resurrection changes a person. In our verse from Acts, Simon Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. It's hard to believe that those words came out of Simon Peter's mouth. God disrupted Simon Peter's belief system. He believed that Jews and Gentiles should not associate with each other. But because of the vision that God gave to him, and especially because of his interaction with a Gentile named Cornelius, Simon Peter had a conversion. I preached a sermon before on a larger section of Acts chapter 10, from which this verse comes today. This sermon gives the full context of Simon Peter's statement. I titled the sermon, The Conversion of Simon Peter. This story of Simon Peter and Cornelius has often been called the conversion of Cornelius. But Simon Peter had as much a change, perhaps a more radical change than Cornelius. Not only was Cornelius a Gentile, but he was also a soldier in the Roman army. Remember that the Romans had occupied Israel, and so many Jews despised them, understandably so. Yet, after meeting Cornelius, Simon Peter said that God shows no distinction between Jew and Gentile. It really was an amazing transformation that happened to Simon Peter. Being encountered by the risen Christ will do this to us. The God who has been revealed in Jesus Christ disrupts our lives. United Methodist minister Jim Bankston points out that Andrew Greeley, author and Roman Catholic priest, once wrote these words, if anyone wishes to eliminate uncertainty, tension, confusion, and disorder from one's life, there is no point in getting mixed up with Jesus of Nazareth. If we want our lives to be undisturbed and to remain on the same course, then we ought not follow Jesus. Jesus shakes up our lives. The resurrection of Jesus isn't just about the amazing news of God raising Jesus from the dead. It's about how resurrection happens in us and to us. William Sloan Coffin says, because Christ is risen, we too are risen. The resurrection reminds us that God does some amazingly surprising things in our lives. When we, like Mary Magdalene, think all the doors have been shut, God opens another door. And as it was with Mary Magdalene, when we think that God can only fill in the blanks in our lives with something that only we have thought of, God fills in the blanks with something we have never considered. Do we feel like our lives are stuck and that there is no possibility of getting unstuck? Do we feel all options have been extinguished? Do we go up in our heads and create impossibilities and convince ourselves that nothing new will happen to bring happiness or joy? Remember this day and it's amazing news. God can bring resurrection to all the dead places of our lives. The new is possible. But it's hard to believe that resurrection makes a difference with, with all that is going on in the world and all that we are facing. In the midst of COVID-19, we may wonder, where is resurrection? How can we affirm resurrection in these very difficult and scary times? 
Where is resurrection in the midst of the outbreak of this vicious virus and in the midst of death? Where is resurrection when we seem to be living in a Good Friday world? But resurrection does not promise us that all suffering and pain will disappear. What it does give us is the hope that in the face of suffering and pain and tremendous fear, God is with us. Because of God, we have hope. Hope isn't wishful thinking. Hope, instead, is the confident assurance of God's presence no matter what we face. God has not caused this virus, but God is with us no matter what the future may hold. I believe that God even hurts with us. The resurrection of Jesus brings us hope, and so we can push on today and in the days ahead. Because of the resurrection, disappointments, difficulties, and disillusionments don't have to be determinative of our faith. Because of the resurrection, even though we may be down, we are down for the count. We follow a surprising and sensational God. So God does greater things than we could ever imagine. This day isn't just about something stupendous that happened approximately 2,000 years ago. No resurrection comes to us wherever and whenever we might be watching and listening to this video. You and I may have had times in our past when the resurrection has lifted us and that we have felt that we can keep going in the face of whatever confronts us. Today can also be one of those days because Easter is busting loose wherever we might be watching and listening today. Resurrection is waiting to seize us and shake us and give us a new beginning. come to a time of prayer, we hold in our hearts all those who are affected by COVID-19, those who are ill, those whose loved ones are ill, those who have lost their job and don't know how to put food on the table, those who are continue to work, who continue to put their own health on the line for our sake and so many others, we hold them in prayer and pray that they would feel God's presence with them always. And we also, of course, continue to hold all those on our prayer list tightly in prayer as well. And of course, those prayers only God knows. So as we go to a time of prayer, I invite you to join me in a moment of silence 
so that we might raise our individual prayers and concerns and joys up to God. Let us pray. Holy One, when the day is quiet and the world still sleeps and love breathes again, we praise you, O God of resurrection. When the day is new and the sun is fresh and the stone has rolled away, we praise you, O God of empty tombs. In this light of this Easter morning, we raise those who are struggling with illness, loneliness, despair, and worry. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the light of Easter morning, we hold in our hearts the pain of those suffering violence, conflict, poverty, so much need. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the light of Easter morning, we see the world differently now. What we thought was the way of things yesterday is no longer the way of things today. Death was yesterday. New life is today. Tombs that were once sealed are now open. We pray all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. We are reminded when we read John's account of the resurrection that Mary Magdalene went to visit Jesus' tomb that morning while it was still dark outside, and she found it empty. We, too, are in the midst of so much darkness in our world, and yet there are so many places where we can look to find that hope and wonder and gratitude that Mary experienced on that morning. We can walk outside and see spring all around us, feel the light breeze on our faces, see the buds blooming on the trees. We have the opportunity to worship like this with one another, and despite our difference, to continue to feel that connection, though in a new way, that connection that we have with each other and with our God and the risen Christ. And so I invite you to give this morning so that we might continue to share with others that same hope and wonder and love that we feel right now, this morning. Let us pray. Generous God, just when we thought that death had claimed your son, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us again with your ability to turn these humble offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness to your love. We lay ourselves at your feet, O oh God, knowing that you will use us to proclaim and embody the gospel. Amen.
This is Christ's table to which we come now, and all are welcome here, no matter who we are. The words of Jan Richardson remind us of this invitation of Christ, where all are welcome. Listen to these words that are simply titled, and the table will be wide. And the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will open wide to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive, and we will come as children who trust there is enough, and we will come unhindered and free, and our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine, and we will open our hands to the feast without shame, and we will turn toward each other without fear, and we will give up our appetite for despair, and we will taste and know of delight, and we will become bread for a hungering world, and we will become drink for those who thirst, and the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. We give you thanks, O Lord, for your good, and your steadfast love endures forever. As did the disciples of old, we felt lost from your love, and our fears drove us to hiding. Now we can cast aside the fears that once weighed us down, for Christ is risen. In this bread, we remember the broken body of Jesus and the fact that you loved us unto death. In this bread, we find the food of our souls to nourish and strengthen us in the living Christ. As we partake, we come out of hiding to tell the world that our Christ is alive. Amen. Please pray with me. Creator God, we are thankful for the opportunity to gather around your table in our homes, healthcare facilities, or working long hours providing care and essential services. We come as Easter people with joy and thanksgiving to celebrate Christ's resurrection and victory over death. We are blessed knowing you are beside us as we face these stressful choices of pain and loss, be with us. We seek your comfort and drink from this cup and remember the ultimate gift you gave us when Christ's blood was shed on the cross that we might have eternal life. As we prepare to again receive this special gift, give us the strength to share love and kindness while rejecting hate and suspicion. May we remember you have no favorites and that all people are created in your image and deserve our respect. Now join me in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples in an upper room. And when he was at the table with them, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then after the meal, he took a cup. And after blessing it, he told his disciples that this was the cup of the covenant poured out for all. As often as they drank it, they were to remember him. Let us pray. Holy One, at the table, your promise of life has been made tangible. We have rested in the depth of your love. We have tasted your nourishing, nurturing presence. Together, you have offered us life. Together, by your grace, we accept the life you offer, and we give thanks. Amen.
where shattered hearts are made whole, where wounded souls are healed, where life is stronger than death, there Christ is risen. Where the lonely become our friends, where a stranger is welcomed home, where hope is stronger than despair, there Christ is risen. Where closed wallets are opened, where the anxious find serenity, where love is stronger than hate, there Christ is risen. Christ is our companion on the journey. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is with us. Amen.